Welcome to NASDAQ Trade Talks, where we meet with the top thought leaders and strategists in emerging technologies, digital assets, the regulatory landscape, and capital markets. This segment is presented by Charles Schwab. I'm your host, Jill Malandrino, and joining me on the desk at the NASDAQ Markets that we have Tony Parada, sustainability and regenerative economy expert at PA Consulting, Kyle Hayes, partner at Foley and Lardner, and Brian Nelson, renewable segment leader at ABB. We're here to discuss the future of the energy transition and climate tech investments. Climate Week NYC takes place September 21st through the 28th, and for the month of September, we will spotlight advancements in climate technology with a focus on practical solutions and resilient infrastructure. Our coverage will emphasize how innovation is driving more durable energy systems, efficient resource management, and the modernization of critical infrastructure to meet tomorrow's demands. It is great to have all of you with us. Thank you for kicking off our climate tech coverage for the month of September. Tony, I think there's just a lot to unpack here. When you yep. think about clean energy, it's not just solar and wind farms. Correct, absolutely. It's gonna take a portfolio approach. The future is not fossil free, it's fossil fluid. That will mean nuclear, carbon capture, wind, solar, and of course fossil fuels at a much more efficient rate. Yeah, and Brian, of course, the US energy transition, it requires major investment as well as modernization. Um, it takes time to get these projects online and our demand for electricity and other forms of energy just continue to increase daily. Uh, that's right, and therefore, you know, piggybacking on what Tony said, uh, the diversification of the energy mix is going to be really, really important, and the timing associated with supply is also really important in terms of the different timelines associated with different asset classes and different technologies. So we uh, are seeing a, a, a time and place where renewable electricity, renewable projects are still the quickest to build, um, and we have a longer runway with other types of energy assets, and so... Uh, it just sort of buttresses that point about uh, the need for diversification. Kyle, what does the near-term energy landscape look like right now? Yeah, so uh, near-term, I mean, I think it's kind of trying to understand the mix that we have today. Lots of fossil fuels um, in an old system that I think um, is aging that, that needs to be upgraded. Uh, over the last couple of years, we've seen a dramatic change to renewable energy where we've seen lots of wind come online, we've seen lots of solar come online. We've also started to see energy storage gain some of the, uh, gain some of the grid as well. And so, you know, for now, I think just looking at where we are and where we're going and then trying to meet that need. I think we've already talked about it today. Solar, wind are faster. Uh, natural gas is required but the supply chains are long, and so it's gonna be a mix of everything moving forward. And excuse me, I called you Kyle That's by okay. accident. You are yeah. Brian. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a tall order ahead of us though, Tony, uh, yeah. when you think about the cost of it, getting these projects online in a timely manner, the technology's not gonna stop, no. right? And in addition to the increase in demand we have, we're doing it on an aging grid. We're looking to do it cleaner and more economical. And unfortunately, we're doing it in the face of more frequent extreme weather events. Yeah. So that is a toll order. The, the good news is investment is moving. The International Energy Agency expects about a, a one and a half trillion dollars spent on this in 2025. So the good news is there is innovation and there is investment getting mobilized. Well, I think it's important to, to touch on this point of innovation, right? Because this is really, it's an exciting time for energy. We're starting to see more digitalized grid, which helps us inform, make decisions. We're also starting to see and have seen over the course of decades this lower levelized cost of electricity out of renewables through innovation, mm -hmm. right? Um, taking what was traditionally a thousand volt DC system to a 2000 volt DC system really kind of unlocks some efficiencies, continues to drive down the cost of renewables, which makes it even more competitive to, to fossil fuels. Yeah, and that's the thing, part of the challenge too is when you think about the utility sector and just the time that it takes to get these projects online. I mean, you think about providing, you know, power to the grids and so forth, that could be anywhere from seven to 12 years. That's right. Uh, <clears throat> and certainly for um, more typical nuclear type projects, you're talking that seven to 12 year range, even for uh, gas fired projects, you're talking about five to seven years in terms of all of the permitting associated with it, and most importantly, supply chain associated with it. So you really do have a long runway to some of these other quote unquote baseload type of resources, which is why that renewable penetration is important in the short term. Yeah. And, and when you look at that comparatively to how quickly you can build an AI or a data center, two years compared to your point, a, a decade worth of grid manufacture, you can see that, that those lines very begin, they diversify very quickly and they diverge. But the biggest holdup though, I would imagine is you know land acquisition 
right, from acquiring the land to operation and then all of the regulatory agencies and communities involved to get from permit to operation. That's correct, yeah, the permitting aspect is, it's more localized than I think people understand, yeah. right? So you're dealing with a lot of land, landowners and, and local officials and that kind of thing, but then also to your point about government agencies, you know, interconnection is a huge part of any kind of energy project penetration and therefore the the interconnection uh, queue all over the country has been very very slow historically slow uh, because you have you know for lack of better words uh, decentralized regulators that are also involved in that as well yeah I mean but it's challenging because we're thinking about scale speed transparency yes. and getting these you know power sources up and running and so in my my mind I'm thinking okay what if we can't build the amount of transmission that we need what if we can't even build the the, the distribution system to what we need, you know, we're gonna, I think, find ourselves in a more distributed grid, so more microgrids, more virtual power plant plants, potentially, and then also this idea of flexibility, which I've seen in the past year been talked about a tremendous amount. Like, how do we make the grid more flexible as a means to maybe accept more demand growth without this convergence of um, our ability to build out the system to support it? I think that's going to be really interesting, too, as we consider all sources of electricity, mm -hmm. but also this flexibility aspect, too. For instance, can a, can a data center be flexible for a couple of hours per year? If they can, then there are some efficiencies to the grid that can be had by doing that. And so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out long term. Tony, what's also interesting is that AI and data centers, as you point out in your notes, it's a nuanced category. Even if it doubles to 2030, that's only 1.5% consumption to 3%, but that seems to get all the attention because of the AI and tech story. It, it does. AI is, is the bell of the ball in the news right now, but if you take a look globally, cooling is a much greater percentage of that usage. It comes in at 10% and growing, and unfortunately, you tend to need cooling in the same places over the same times and that will continue to grow. So that is a, a vastly more significant challenge than even AI is once you take a look outside the US. Do you expect regulatory um, issues to be worked through so that we can onboard these operations more quickly and efficiently? I do, I think the, the regulatory landscape is going to have to play ball with industry, right? Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the energy industry is one of the most highly regulated in the country. Um, both at the federal and state level. Um, and then you have some in-between regulators, for example, the decentralized power operators. Um, so, uh, so, for example, like in, in Texas, the uh, ERCOT, or in New York, the New York ISO, right? So the regulatory landscape uh, has to move commensurate with the industry as we go along the, you know, the path of, of uh, trying to diversify our energy mix and also trying to make sure that we have enough um, you know, supply for demand. And I think we're going to be forced into this corner, right? I mean, right. I, we've already seen some changes, policy changing to make things a little bit easier on the permitting front, starting to put some more money into nuclear about how do we speed up nuclear as well. But I think we're going to be backed into a corner here where we're going to really need kind of everybody to take a look at themselves in the mirror and say, what can we do to make this easier? Yeah, well, also with existing infrastructure as well. We are running out of time. Correct. Yeah, we, I mean, we have a tremendously old grid. I mean, I think 70% um, of our transmission system is, is 25 years old. The average age of a power transformer is 40 years old. And the average age of a circuit breaker is 25 years old. We are at the life expectancy of a lot of this equipment. And so the grid is, while we're talking about all of this growth and adding in new generation sources, the grid also needs attention. And so really it's a great time to think about digital and how we can enable that digital future to hopefully get some benefits down the road of some of this information coming back. I mean, Tony, it's only 15 years away, right? You have to think about that now, particularly the amount of time it takes for these projects. And not only are we running out of time, candidly, we're running out of materials. So rare earth minerals is right. a major choke point right now. Uh, there's consideration here in the U.S. that we'll move the CHIPS Act to really have it go after rare earth minerals in this country uh, for geopolitical reasons, our own safety and security needs, et cetera. And then there's a talent shortage. So the expectation is half a million electricity workers will retire over the next 10 years in the US. Those are skills that we need to replace and they are readily transferable. Well, and I think it's important to mention that too, that those seasoned linemen and women that are gonna retire, which we've, I mean, are fortunate to have had for all of these years, their skill sets are also changing, right? We are moving to a more distributed grid or more uh, digital grid, whether we like it or not. And so the skill sets are also gonna have to adapt over time and we need to make sure 
as a country, we're setting you know folks up for success. I think to be able to fall into those roles. And Brian, I'll put a little bit of a fine point on that. And that we talk about linemen. I think utility companies are sort of caught in the crosshairs here, right? In the sense that there's this huge need to meet electricity demand, but also they have to go to their regulators to recover their opex, and also they, they want more capex to put into their rate base, right, in order to both stabilize and expand the grid. So I think th they're sort of in, a, in an interesting position there. I totally agree with you, Kyle. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's interesting that you brought up the um, reskilling or upskilling of the electricians within the workforce because we have a shortage of cybersecurity professionals as well. And when you digitize the grid, which of course is a national security issue as well, there is a, a lot of reskilling and upskilling, but also a lot of opportunity. These are great jobs to have. They're great jobs to have. The, the outlook for energy is really good for a long time. Right. So you get in now and I think uh, we're only gonna see it continue to, to grow and it just be a, an interesting place to be. You brought up survival of the fittest when it comes to clean tech in your investment outlook, right? So what does that mean? Or, or we can't just have one form of an energy resource. That's right, Why well, I, I think the, the thesis of, of what I was saying was that there's, as you've seen, there's a lot of market consolidation right now. Right. And we're seeing that a lot of the bigger players are acquiring some of the smaller players, particularly in the distributed generation area. And I think that as we go forward and folks start to try to adopt to the new regulatory guidance um, and safe harboring strategies with the tax credits, what's left of them, um, I think that those bigger players who are doing things at scale and are more used to project development at scale um, are likely going to end up being the, the, the last one standing in a lot of instances. There are certainly smaller developers with really nimble uh, development teams who are, who are going to be able to uh, withstand the test of time, but I do think that you're going to see quite a bit of consolidation. Yeah. Uh, and I do think we've spent a lot of time talking about the challenges we face. There's an immense opportunity that you raised earlier. There's also amazing bright spots in the world of innovation as well. You've got Commonwealth Fusion here in Massachusetts. Uh, looking at fusion technology over the next decade. It's a lot of that investment's being led by the tech industry. Um, that allows them to become a test bed for some of these innovations to take hold in a more, much more robust way. Yeah, we were talking about that off camera as well, how there's just even different ways of deploying it, modular mm -hmm. as an example, which allows it to, you know, it's, it's more accessible to make it more sustainable in terms yep. of the long term as well. And, and something as simple as where should I locate my data center? Maybe pushing it further geographically north allows a natural cooling effect to bring down those energy demands. Which is interesting because then you start thinking about public-private partnerships as well. Perhaps tech companies, as, a, as an example, will be the forerunners of some energy deployment. I think the opportunity there is, is massive, right? Because these are uh, tremendously large projects. They have a tremendous community impact. Um, through that kind of partnership and coming to the table early with their ideas to talk about how we're going to add this to the to community, but also not be a burden on the community, right? Which I think is yeah. incredibly important um, because at the end of the day, what you want to limit, right, is for the everyday rate payer to see some sort of increase that maybe isn't necessarily close coupled to what they're doing, right? We want to have this greater benefit um, of the community. And I think data centers together with utilities and, and rate payers can work together to find that best solution uh, for that community. I also think transparency and where the money is going and how to make public-private partnerships accountable is something that consumers and taxpayers want as well. I think that's right and I think to build on Brian's point you're seeing that for example in Maryland they recently passed legislation where uh, data centers are going to be classified under a different rate class than residential rate payers, right? And the whole concept there is to not necessarily make the residential rate payers pay for the same system upgrades and that kind of thing needed uh, for, for data centers as a much bigger demand center. Um, and so part, of, part and parcel of that was, to your point about building transparency for the public about, you know, uh, we, we, we need these data centers um, uh, for purposes of, um, you know, AI, but uh, we also don't necessarily want to foot the little guy with, with the bill, and so let's do something about it and make sure that that's publicly seen. Yeah. Right. It's almost like having everyone pay the amount of insurance for a Ferrari when not everyone is driving mm. a Ferrari. That's one way to put it. Yeah. Right? I mean, that's one way to think of it. <laughs> you, you brought up um, science and, and critical earth minerals before, Tony. Are we overlooking some things that might be more readily available? Seawater, as we, an example? We absolutely are. There are some reactors around the world. Uh, there's a, a type of reactor called an osmotic energy generator that uses just the difference between fresh water and salt water to create electricity. Um, we mentioned the Commonwealth Fusion Reactor coming online. Uh, geothermal is taking big holds in Northern Europe in particular. Um, there are a lot of innovation that we're beginning to tap into and it will take that portfolio approach. 
um, at the end of the day, we advise clients that resiliency is the new currency. Whatever yeah. form that needs to take, that is your new currency. Yeah, I, I mean, Brian, it's, it's, you know, clean tech, energy investments, and, and so forth. It seems as if the investment case is there. It really is. It just takes a long time. It's capital it, intensive. It, it is, um, you know, but they're also thinking about different financial structures as well, thinking about how we can maybe tailor to like an as a service model, right? So if you need a, a energy storage, and this is something that, that ABB's thought about, um, instead of that upfront CapEx, how do we work that into maybe a long-term, um, you know, pay to play kind of uh, activity where you have this joint benefit, right? You have a grid benefit, you also have benefit at the corporation, and then um, there's some, some room in there for some investors as well. And so I think thinking about what the financial models need to do to shift to adapt is also important to consider. Yeah, or, or is some of the pushback you, you get, is that because of how long the return can take on some of it can, it can, depending where you are, it can take yeah. a very long time. In some cases, it can take one event and you've already paid it back. Um, yeah. So it is important to, I think, just consider, do you want to have that CapEx expenditure immediately or would it be better to structure it over 20, 30 years and just understand so, that? And that's what makes it interesting, Kyle, right? These alternative ways of financing and how these projects are getting built and the incentives built in. Yeah, certainly, uh, you know, as the tax credits start to sunset, I think there's a lot of questions around, okay, well, how do these projects get financed? You know, from a project development perspective, if you have strong fixed revenue contracts associated with a project, for example, it's still a good project. And so I think the concept, at least in my mind, is that these projects are still gonna be financed, albeit the power prices associated with those projects are very likely to be higher in the absence of the subsidies, um, which is a bit of an unavoidable consequence of what's going on. Right, so the challenge is, Tony, is getting the buy-in. Right. It's getting the buy-in, and, and I think a place that we will pay particular attention to is this concern that some individuals may say, let me just go and build my own independent power generation, disconnected from the public utility space. Uh, you can see how that has real significant financial benefit but that tends to leave the rest of us behind, and that's not really where we want to go. We want to see that collaboration happen, whether it's a microgrid or a super regional grid. We really want to stay away from independent power generation. Is that even possible? Be I mean, oh, it's a heavily at, regulated space. So. Uh, to Kyle's point earlier, yes, small, medium, and modular reactors are about a decade away, but now you've got significant players looking at what would it take for me to have an SMR on site for my own needs and purposes. Um, so I think this notion of resiliency at a very independent level is continuing to grow and is becoming an area for consideration. Yeah, I think the uh, I, I think the decoupling away from wholesale rates to rely more on distribution rates uh, with behind the meter type generation is certainly going to be part of the conversation going forward. Yeah, and it, it's interesting because while one and a half percent of the demand is derived from AI in data centers, that's what we were talking about before, yep. it seems to be how the conversation was accelerated. 100%. I yeah. think there were some studies over the last year or two where people started to really understand, oh, wow, if we're using AI, it requires 10x more electricity than like a normal, you know, search on your computer. It's like, wait a second. If we really build this out, we're going to be in trouble here. we got to figure out what we're doing and, and make sure the grid's ready for this growth. Yeah. Well, it, it, it's just so interesting how AI is the one to really foster this conversation and get it more mainstream. Appreciate all of your insights. Thanks for joining us on Trade Talks. I'm Jill Melandrino, Global Markets Reporter at NASDAQ.